Well, welcome everyone to week 16 of Oceanside School of the Bible's 2020 Bible Reading Challenge. This year, 2020, we are reading the entirety of the Bible from beginning to end in chronological order, in the historical order that all these books unfolded. And it's been a great journey that we've been doing together. You've been reading and asking us questions. And then on Monday nights on this YouTube live stream, myself and Mark Manfredi, our main teacher for this series, has been answering those questions as we look back on the preceding week's readings and kind of unpack it all for you. Not only helping you to understand the significance of what happened, but also digging deeper and pulling out those practical points of teaching and those principles that we can apply to our own lives, as well as have a big picture view and understanding and appreciation of the Bible. Uh, This week, like every other week, you can text in your questions to 250-740-1026 and ask us anything. And we'll cue those questions up and then we'll present them to Mark when he does the teachings on each Monday night. Maybe you're not watching the live stream. We encourage you to come back on Monday nights at 717 Pacific Standard Time and join us for that so you can participate in the live chat. Or maybe you're listening to the audio podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Hey, however you found us, we are really glad you're with us. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be doing some character studies based on the readings that we're currently doing. The first two kings of Israel are going to be our focus. This week, we're going to look at the life of King Saul. And next week, we're going to look at the life of King David. So we're hoping you'll join us for that. Now we had some technical glitches this week with our live stream and so we actually had to kind of pull the plug on it. So this is a pre-recording you're going to watch this week of Mark teaching and then we'll be back with everybody live again next week. So we're excited you're here. Again text those questions to 250-740-1026 and let's just move over to Mark. Let him pray and then we'll jump into it. Well hello. Just wanted to say before we get started tonight, how much I appreciate uh, the questions that you're texting in. Uh, I'm just one person reading and praying through the scriptures just like you. And uh, many times I see things a certain way. And those questions are so great because they give us different perspectives, uh, help us to be able to go into different things as as I'm teaching through. And so thanks so much for those of you that are taking the time to text in those questions anytime, day or night. Uh, They're very helpful when it comes into comes the time to teaching. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this scripture. And Lord, I thank you for your goodness, Lord. And as we examine um, one life tonight, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd be speaking to us about our own lives as well. Lord, I thank you that you're able to do this through technology in different times and spaces and locations. Nothing limits you, Lord. So we just welcome your presence tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Do things a little bit differently uh, for this edition. Um, For the next two weeks, we're going to be looking through the lives of two very different kings, Uh, Saul, Israel's first king, and David, Israel's second king. And in the readings we've done this last week, of course, there is a lot of overlap between those two kings. I just felt like as I was preparing my notes and for simplicity's sake, I wanted to deal with just with Saul's life tonight. And then next week, we'll deal with David's life. So thank you for those that have sent in questions regarding David. We'll save those and we'll use those Uh, this next week as we go through David's life. But tonight we want to focus on the life of Saul, Israel's first king. Just to review, uh, we're coming out of the Judges period, that real dark, sort of distressing 300-year period, probably the low point spiritually in the life of the nation of Israel. Um, And Samuel was the last judge that came out of that period and his sons briefly after him. So he was kind of this transitional figure. He sets in the first and second kings. Uh, for uh, the nation of Israel. So he's the last judge. Israel wanted a human and an earthly king, even though God was their heavenly king. And they knew that, uh, and God was protecting and caring for them. But they looked around at all the pagan nations around them and you know, said, everybody else has got a king. We want a king too. And you know, God was gracious, and he acquiesced, I think, and, and allowed them to have a king. I'm not sure that was his original intention, um, because there's a lot of problems that come with having a king, which we're going to see many of those uh, in our teaching tonight. Uh, but God's good in that, and he chose a king for them. He chose Saul to be their first king, and he instructs Samuel uh, to anoint Saul as their king. And we see that in uh, 1 Samuel 9, 15 to 17. Now the Lord had told Samuel the previous day, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him to be the leader of my people Israel. 
You will rescue them from the Philistines, for I have looked down on my people in mercy and have heard their cry. When Samuel saw the Lord, he said, That's the man I told you about. He will rule my people. So Samuel sets in Saul as the first king. It's definitely God's plan. Uh, this was God's intention. It's the man that he chose. And when you think about Saul, uh, he had a lot going for him, and his life really started out well. He came from a wealthy and influential family. Um, he was tall and good-looking. Scripture says he was head and shoulders above the, you know, the crowd. Uh, Israel was looking for a king, and he probably looked kingly, whatever that looks like. Uh, so he was a good-looking guy. Uh, and initially, it seems like he wasn't really seeking the position of a king. It doesn't look like his ego was really involved. You know, in the day of his anointing, they have to go looking for him. He's hide out, hiding out among the baggage, uh, maybe cowering. I'm not sure. But he definitely was looking for position at that time. So it's probably a good start in that way. Um, in First Samuel chapter 10, it says that God gave Saul a new heart. I think there was an, an amazing moment uh, between Saul and God where God poured out maybe an anointing or a calling or the significance of what he was going to be as the first king of Israel. Uh, and gave him a new heart, a heart for the people maybe, or a heart for the Lord. There was something genuine that the Lord did uh, in that moment with Saul. Um, scripture a couple times says the Spirit of God came upon him. We see that in 1 Samuel 11 and 19, other, chat, other places. I remember in the book of Judges, the Holy Spirit would come on a particular leader for a particular time for deliverance of the people. We see that same kind of thing happening with the first king with Saul. Um, God gave him a lot of military victories, which was uh, many times miraculous because ha most of the time they were outgunned and outnumbered and, you know, the odds were seriously against them. So uh, you do see God blessing Saul in these military victories, these these moves to protect the people of God in the land when the neighbors started to come in and cause trouble. Um, and maybe one of the most significant things that Saul did was he unified these 12 tribal groups. If you think through the book of Judges, many times the tribes are kind of operating independently, or maybe there'll be a, a foreign power that comes in, and maybe one or two tribes will get together and go after them, or a tribes in the south will do something. But it's not a unified nation. And one of the things, probably the greatest contribution that Saul made was he brought all these 12 tribal groups together and helped them to see themselves as a nation, as the nation of Israel, as the people of God and started to help them work together in concert as a nation. So that's a significant uh, kind of ministry that Saul did in his life. He had a lot going for him. God set him up well and resourced him to be a good king. You know, and he started off well. But soon the character flaws begin to show up uh, in Saul's life. And my wife, Dean, and I were talking about this this week and thinking about Saul and David in our readings. And Dean said, you know, um, I don't think, position and power and platform and prestige, I don't think that makes a person. She said, I think it just reveals the true nature of what is in a person. And sadly, I think we're seeing that in Saul's life, because even though he began well, we see some character flaws that begin to develop. Um, Saul showed a lack of faith by overstepping his role. We see that in 1 Samuel 13, verses 7. Remember we talked about last week the three roles that are developing in the nation of Israel. Uh, the prophet, that's the one who speaks for God. We're seeing more and more of the prophetic ministry. The priestly role, that would be the, from the line of Aaron, and Eli would be the, just the most recent priest coming before this. Uh, and then the king. And those three roles were separate roles, and they each had sort of spheres of influence, and they weren't to extend into other areas. So the prophet doesn't call the nation to war or try to lead the nation, and the, the king doesn't step into that priestly role. Those three roles are significant. Uh, and yet we see Samuel showing a lack of faith by overstepping his role in 1 Samuel 17, uh, 1 Samuel 13, 7. It says, Meanwhile, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, as Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel didn't come. Saul realized his troops were rapidly slipping away, so he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings, and Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. That's something that he should not have done. He shouldn't have stepped out in, in his lack of faith and grabbed that offering because it wasn't his place to do. And, of course, right after that, Samuel shows up and calls him out on it. 
And I see what happens as a pattern beginning in Saul's life. When he's called out, he makes excuses and blames others. We see that starting in verse 11. Well, the people were scattering and the enemies were coming. He's got all everybody else's problem. He blames it except taking responsibility for what he should not have done. Um, I see also in Saul's life that there was often an impatience or an, an unwillingness to wait for the word of God. We see this in 1 Samuel 14. When God is, Saul is inquiring of God and yet, you know, things are happening fast in the battlefield. He's like, forget that. Just, just get out there and do it, you know. So there's an impatience. Um, he makes some hasty and foolish decisions uh, without consulting his leaders. So we see that with that vow of no eating food in 1 Samuel 14, if you remember that. You know, he's just sort of this random thing that he says for the whole army and of course it ends up really affecting their performance and what could have been even a greater victory if he wouldn't just made that rash response. I think his leaders or you know, his generals are saying, what are you saying? What are you doing? You know, he just didn't reference those people around himself. So he made some hasty and foolish decisions. Um, and I think maybe the biggest character flaw that I see in Saul's life is that he cut corners um, and didn't follow God's instructions completely. This was be, would have been a very big deal for someone who was the king of Israel uh, in 1 Samuel 15, 3, um, God instructs him to destroy the Amalekite nation. Now go and completely destroy the Amalekite nation. We go down in verse 9. And Saul and his men spared Agag, that was the king, and kept the best of the sheep and the goats and the cattle and the fat calves and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or poor, or poor quality. So you see Saul begins to cut these corners, and he sort of listens to God, but it's like, well, I'll just sort of do what is convenient for me in terms of those instructions, and I won't do the things that are not convenient for me. Uh, and that's a big character flaw that began to see come up in, in Saul's life. When you think about Saul's leadership style, I think there's some things that we can observe there in terms of how he led the nation, and how he led his leaders, and how he led his troops. Uh, unfortunately, many times we see Saul led by fear and coercion. In 1 Samuel 11, there's that issue where he chops up his auction and nails out the pieces, you know, to all over Israel and says, look, anybody who doesn't come and do what I say, your auction will be chopped up too. And, and it says that people feared. So, you know, he's, he's, he's motivating many times out of fear or out of coercion. Um, it's interesting that Saul developed an army of draftees, not volunteers. There are a few men that came over to him very early in his kingship. But uh, we see in in First Samuel fourteen fifty two, it was it was an army of draftees and and many as many of you know that have served in the military, a draftee army is a very different army than an army of volunteers, and we'll talk about that next week under David too. But and we think a little bit more about his leadership style. He set up a monument to himself. We see that in First Samuel fifteen. That can't be a good sign in terms of pride and arrogance. To, to make a monument to yourself and celebrate yourself. It just doesn't seem like a, a godly king thing to do. Um, often he wouldn't make hard calls due to pressure. So in 1 Samuel 15, you know, he's not, he sort of abdicates his leadership for the, for what the crowd wants. He doesn't do the hard thing, the thing that God would want him to do as a king. And he sort of acquiesces to the people and what their needs are. So you see him sort of caving to, popular uh, to popularity maybe or people pleasing um, in terms of other issues of his leadership style you know he set up this deceptive plan for the Philistines to kill David his uh, soon-to-be son-in-law so he's trying to sort of make it seem like David's gonna get killed by his enemies but really it's Saul behind the scenes pulling the strings trying to get a, a, a murder arranged for David um, you know, he, he mortgages his own daughter's future uh, for his personal gain. She, of course, was in love with David at that time, and he uses this whole bride price thing to try to have David killed. So you see some reflections of his style there. Um, and then a very sad part in his life, in, in a moment of rage, he slaughters innocent priests just to make a point. You see that in 1 Samuel 22. Um, so he comes in and just out of anger, kills these priests who are innocent who are just had been interacting with David in a very normal way but uh, that that issue of rage I think we see that in uh, Saul's life a lot and, and it comes through in his leadership style he just 
gets sort of out of control and doesn't listen to God, doesn't listen to anybody around him and just flies off the handle and does, you know, incredibly uh, tragic things because of this rage that gets hold of him. So we begin to definitely see some cracks in his style and how he led as a nation. Um, and toward the middle part of his life, there begins a rapid downward spiral that's really fueled by jealousy and bitterness. Uh, and this is really the, the, coming into the very sad part, I think, of, of this life. The Spirit of the Lord departs from Saul. We see that in 1 Samuel 16, 14. Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. Uh, so that blessing, that anointing, that presence of God that he started with departs from Saul. And that moves Saul into a very dark place. Um, I think because of his rebellion and because of his anger and some things we'll talk about in a minute, he opens the door for the demonic to be able to come in. And there's some things that begin to deal with his life in terms of depression and fear, things that come into his life that he opened the door for uh, because of his anger and because of his jealousy. Um, Saul allows jealousy really to take over his life. As David starts to become more and more successful in battle, Saul begins to get uh, more and more angry against David. And we see that in 1 Samuel 18. David returns from war and, the, you know, the maidens are singing along the way. You know, Saul has killed his thousands and David's his tens of thousands, you know. And that really, really makes Saul's insecurity come out. Um, he was threatened by David's successes. And in 1 Samuel 18, 14 is a real good illustration of that. Um, 1814, David continued to succeed in everything he did, for the Lord was with him. When Saul recognized this, he became even more afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was so successful at leading his troops into battle. So he becomes, Saul becomes more and more resentful and more and more angry and more and more fearful. Um, he even uh, turns his two children or attempts to turn his two children against David, his daughter who had married David, who loved David, and his son Jonathan, who was like his best bro. Uh, and he tries to get both of them to betray, in, in, in his son's case, even to murder David. He urged his servants to be able to assassinate David if possible. So you see, he just starts to spiral out of control and spin out of control in this fixation with trying to eliminate David in his life. Uh, he has remorse sometimes. You remember through your reading, those of you who have been reading, there's two times that God delivers uh, Saul right into David's hands in these caves, and he could have just taken his life at an instant in two different places, and yet David, out of respect for the anointing and the position that Saul held, did not do that. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of each of those incidences, Saul is remorseful. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. You're right, you know. But he doesn't repent, meaning he goes right back to very shortly chasing David and trying to uh, wipe David off the face of the earth. So there's remorse, but there's not repentance in his life. Um, and then a very sad period of his time toward the end of his life, he actually goes and uh, seeks out an, uh, um, an occult uh, medium. You see that in, in 1 Samuel 28, in one of the weirdest you know, things in Scripture, um, he goes and seeks out this, this medium, this spiritual occult, spiritual medium, the old translations translate the witch of Endor. Um, he knew better than this. First off, if you remember back, if you've read the law of Moses, those of us have been reading, there were not to be allowed any um, necromancers or, you know, uh, anybody who dealt with the occult arts. All those kind of things were forbidden, actually forbidden by death in the nation of Israel. Uh, and Saul himself had set out a mandate earlier that those people were not to be allowed in the nation, so he knew better. But in the midst of his sort of downward spiral into darkness, he seeks out, you know, the voice of the Lord, and the Lord is not speaking to him. And so he he goes and says, well, is there an, is there an occult, uh, you know, medium somewhere, someone who can raise the dead and speak from the dead? And, he, you know, he seeks this lady out in First Samuel 28, and it's a very complicated passage. A lot of people have a lot of views on this passage. Um, I just look at it this way. You know, there's two spiritual forces in the universe there's god and his kingdom and the power of his light and then there's a demonic and an earthly and a, and a earthly and a fallen kingdom that satan leads um, they're not equal in any way it's not like star wars you know 50 50 kind of a thing god is sovereign over all in the end 
Jesus speaks one word and the battle is over. So it's not like that. But uh, Satan does have considerable power and he is a deceiver. He's the father of lies, Jesus says. Um, and so he can mimic or photocopy a lot of things to make them look legitimate. And I just think anytime somebody is dealing with someone who has an occult background, is seeking information from any other source other than the living God, it's all going to be clouded with with um, untruth and you just can't depend on it. So I, I just, I don't even spend a whole lot of time thinking about what was going on here. What was this and who was that? It's all tainted with the demonic. And so it can't be trusted in any way. And But it just shows the sad place of where Saul was in his life, that he ends up toward the end of his life doing that. Um, again, opens up more doors for demonic hassles in his life and greater persecution from the demonic. Uh, that's why I always would say to people, and we've mentioned it before in the 2020 challenge, just stay far away from anything, you know, tarot readers, even horoscopes, people who are speaking through power sources that aren't uh, of God, of God, the God of the Bible, through Jesus Christ. Just run away from that stuff, because when you get involved in that, even in small ways, um, you open a door for the demonic, and the demonic will take that and take any um, legal right that they can take to ha bring a hassle into your life. And I think that's one of the things that we see so sadly taking over as that downward spiral of darkness takes place in Saul's life. And of course, his life ends very sadly on the battlefield and he actually commits suicide. He takes his own life and falls in his sword in, in 1 Samuel 31. And so we see a just a sad conclusion to a life that could have been very different. And as I think about Saul's life and sort of try to put that into perspective, a couple things come out to me. One is I think that there was an unwillingness to let go when God had moved on. Saul held on to his position. He held on to what he wanted as power. He wasn't willing to release or to move when God moved. Um, and that's what I think was one of the key things that we see ended up being so tragic about his life. You know, his son Jonathan realized this early on in 1 Samuel 20. Um, Jonathan is talking to David. Um, let's see if I can find it here. And yeah, and, and Jonathan, Saul's son, says to David, may the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father. So even his own son realized that God had departed from him. And, and Saul even knew this in 1 Samuel 24, verse 17. Speaking to David here, um, he says, you're a better man than I am, and you've repaid me good for evil. And now I realize that you're surely going to be king. The kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. So even Saul recognizes this, that, you know, God has moved and anointed David and, and lifted from him. We see it again in 1 Samuel 26, that same theme. But God, uh, but Saul is not willing to release and to to move into what God is doing in terms of clearly bringing the anointing and even the, the anointed kingship of David. He just continues to perse persecute David, try to eradicate David from the face of the earth, try to protect his own spiritual uh, turf, uh, and it just goes into such a dark place. You know, I can't help but think about what how things would have been different if uh, Saul would have made the short and small adjustments early on when when Samuel spoke to them about things, instead of deflecting and deferring that he would have owned up and come before the Lord and repented, how his kingship could have looked different. You know, if he would have been willing to realize David's, uh, the, the, the genuine anointing of God on David's life, if he could have made a transfer of power and celebrated who David was and what David was doing, I think about all the bloodshed and all the things that could have been prevented in the story later on if he had done that. But he didn't. He wanted to hold on to his power and actually ended up killing him at the end. So, you know, it's a sad story, the story of King Saul. Um, such a great start, but such a tragic ending. And uh, we see this little summary out of the book of uh, First Chronicles, chapter 10 and verse 13. So Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He failed to obey the Lord's command, and he even consulted a medium instead of asking the Lord for guidance. So the Lord killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. Sad, sad ending for this story. 
You know, I have to admit that until this morning, I've been reading Saul's life kind of like as a textbook on, you know, mistakes not to make as a leader. It had all been kind of head stuff for me, um, but it really hadn't got into my heart. And as, as I woke up this morning, was just praying about this broadcast today. I just felt like God brought me to a scripture about how Samuel responded to, to this whole tragedy. We see that in First Samuel 34, First Samuel 15:34. Um, this is how this affected Samuel um, in 34. Then Samuel went home to Ramah, and Saul returned to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel never meant to meet, never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him, and the Lord was sorry he had ever made Saul king of Israel. This broke Samuel's heart, and you know what? It's breaking my heart as I let it in, too. Uh, this story of what could have been was such an amazing leader, called out by God, anointed by God, resourced by God, and yet, um, you know, allowing that darkness to come into his life and eventually destroy his life at great cost for the nation of Israel. Um, so, you know, kind of what's the take home for me as I think about the life of Saul? Uh, what really, really screams to me as I look at his whole life is this, that I really need to beware of jealousy and bitterness. You know, jealousy and bitterness can tear our lives apart and they can destroy us. And I think that's the, at the heart of what really went wrong in Saul's life. And a couple of scriptures in the New Testament that talk about that in James chapter 3, starting in verse 13. James says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth by boost, boasting and lying. Isn't that kind of a picture of Saul's life, covering up the truth? For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For whenever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there, will, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. Just interesting that James in the New Testament is making this connection between jealousy and bitterness and opening this door for the darkness of the demonic to be able to come in and destroy a life. Um, thought about another illustration of that in Acts chapter 8 in the early in the history of the early church. This is in the early days in, in the um, revival that took place in Samaria. And the apostles come across this guy, Simon, who had been a sorcerer and had been amazing to people for many years. And um, Simon sees them laying hands on him, people receiving the Holy Spirit. And he offers them money, you know, hey, let me pay you some money and show me that trick so I can do that too. And in verse 20 of Acts chapter 8, Peter replies to this man, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this for your heart is not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see you are full of bitter jealousy and are held captive by sin. Again, you see this connection between this jealousy and this um, bitterness and the wickedness and the opening that that brings for the evil in our lives. Um, back in Proverbs, uh, there's a just a one little two-liner in uh, Proverbs 14.30. It says, a peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. Um, I've never had bone cancer, but I have had a form of cancer. And I can tell you it's a very scary thing because it develops in your life. And once you start to know about it, it, it affects everything you do. Uh, if it's not stopped, it will take your life. It's something that's insidious and just creeps and continues to consume everything that it can. Um, and jealousy is like that. Jealousy is like a cancer in our bodies. And when we begin to, to fall into jealousy, we begin to fall into bitterness uh, it can destroy us so quickly in our lives. And so as we close this uh, session, I just thought it would be good maybe just to pray a little bit about that and just to give the Lord an opportunity to speak to us and see if there's if maybe there's some pockets of jealousy or maybe some even developed areas of bitterness towards someone. Uh, and just give you an opportunity to make that right before the Lord. So let's just uh, pray before we conclude tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the lessons that you've shown us in Saul's life, the good lessons and the bad lessons. 
Holy Spirit, I just welcome you to come now and speak to us wherever we are in our situation right now, Lord. Heavenly Father, if there is bitterness in my life or jealousy, Lord, would you reveal that to me now? Lord, is there anybody that I'm angry for because they're more successful than I am or getting a greater profile than I think I should be getting that are moving ahead of me in life? Or, Lord, forgive me of that. Forgive us of that, Lord, of that jealousy. We know it's a cancer and we don't want anything to do with it, Lord. God, I pray if you're speaking to someone right now, Lord, that you would bring a measure of repentance for them. And Holy Spirit, I pray you'd flood into them into their lives and and realize the forgiveness that comes for this through the blood of Jesus Christ at the cross so they can be free of this, can be free to be who they are and to succeed in the areas that you've called them to without having to compare them to anyone else. Lord, I just pray for your protection and your freedom from jealousy and bitterness. And thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody, thanks so much again for joining us this week. Mark, a huge thank you for taking the time to re-record that teaching so that we could have it here on this episode. Next week, we're moving into week 17, and we'll be doing a character study on David next Monday night. So we can't wait for you to join us. As always, spend that time setting aside just a few minutes a day to journey along with us. If you'd like to find any resources that you might want to have to support you in this or find out more about where you can get your copy of the Chronological Bible that we're using or download the list of readings for each day, you can find that online at oceansidechurch.ca slash 2020. Guys, have a great week. We'll talk to you again soon.